Welcome to the podcast. In our last episode, we learned about the Wampanoag Antebellum, the period leading up to King Philip's War, a war that has been greatly mischaracterized throughout the centuries, originally mischaracterized by the Puritans themselves, celebrating their victory. The first and probably greatest mischaracterization is that it was a pan Native American uprising against the English. We will find out in this episode that's not exactly true. The second mischaracterization is that King Philip is some sort of military genius, the great leader of many different native peoples in their effort to rid the land of foreign occupiers. In this episode, we will dispel that mischaracterization as we will see other native leaders involved in King Philip's war who were inarguably better fighters, better leaders, better organizers, and far more damaging to the English population than King Philip himself. Which brings us to our last mischaracterization. The idea that the English were almost forced to evacuate New England. You'll hear this sometimes, that the Native Americans almost won this one. By the end of this episode, I will demonstrate that there was no almost in this case. And furthermore, the ultimate failure of King Philip is due to his many Native American enemies as much as his English enemies. And now, if I'm already sounding crass or insensitive, you have to realize that all of these mischaracterizations began with the Puritans themselves after the war, who wanted to justify their newly found forms of subjugation of the Native Americans in the area, who wanted to lionize King Philip, because as the people who beat King Philip, they were only patting themselves on the back. And this episode will help to peel back those layers. So we're going to try to look at King Philip's war, not from the perspective of the English, of the people of Plymouth and Massachusetts and Rhode Island and Connecticut specifically, but rather as this is a Wampanoag episode, we will try to look at King Philip's war from the point of view of the 17th century Wampanoag. And so here we go. By the 1670s, King Philip, who is the supposed paramount chief of the Wampanoag Confederacy, or Paramount Chieftainship, had lost a great deal of the power his brother had before him, or his father before him, who would be Osemaquin, the great native chief who made a treaty with the Plymouth settlers in 1621. By 1671, King Philip was forced to submit all of the Wampanoag people to the authority of Plymouth, a relationship that had turned from allies and friends to master and subordinate. But the truth of the matter is that King Philip only really spoke for a few remaining communities of the Wampanoag who had not already converted to Christianity and who had not already submitted their loyalty to the Plymouth court. This would include the Native American communities on Cape Cod. This would include the praying towns of John Eliot in the Plymouth colony. This would include the Native Americans who lived on Martha's Vineyard in Nantucket. All various native nations that once fell under the paramount chieftainship of King Philip's family. It's interesting to note that by the time King Philip himself submits to the court of Plymouth in September of 1671, perhaps half or more of the Wampanoag had already pulled away from Philip and aligned with the English, which isn't necessarily a cause of war. But in submitting to the court of Plymouth, King Philip agreed to yearly tribute, tribute that he could only pay in giving up land. The court of Plymouth would now be able to confirm native leadership. In other words, Plymouth, if they wanted to, could designate any man the sachem of a native nation. And then coincidentally, that man would be receptive to generous sales of land. Now, the loss of land didn't just affect whole nations of the Wampanoag or the paramount chief King Philip himself. But even individual Wampanoag families would have their land taken away in dribs and drabs, justifiable by fines and defaulted loans. One example being King Philip's own nephew, William, who in 1671 was given a horse by Josiah Winslow, a horse that William reportedly never paid for. Eventually, the debt of one horse led to the seizure of William's land to Josiah Winslow. As you can see, the loss of resources and power is only moving in one direction, and it's only going to get worse unless something changes. Which brings us to a discussion we started in our last episode, wherein King Philip, come 1671, is definitely already planning 
some sort of attack on the English. And even without the fines or the tributes, he is selling land like he never has before. The theory being that he is using these land sales to gain resources to buy guns from illicit English traders, from the French, to stockpile them, and then ideally in a war, win all that land back and more from the English. The historian Nathaniel Philbrick says, By 1673, with the sale of a neck of land to the west of Mount Hope, Philip had succeeded in selling every scrap of land surrounding his territory. Whether on purpose or not, King Philip had backed himself into a corner. And Philip wasn't singular in his feelings. The Wampanoag people, especially those who had not converted to Christianity, they were sick of losing their power. They were sick of losing their land. Moving into just one year before the war, to illustrate this point, the Squaw Sachem Awashunks was greatly angered by her own son, Mama Nua, who was one of these Wampanoag that Plymouth recognized as a sachem simply because he was willing to sell away his people's land. Of course, he had done so without her permission or her people's permission or any consensus among her nation. Awashunks took away from him all his titles and distinction among her people, and she shamed him for the betrayal. But this would be repeated all over what the English would have called the Plymouth Colony. As given a couple thousand people, you'll always find someone who is willing to enrich themselves to the detriment of the whole. In the last episode, I referred to them as Quislings. And so from 1671 on, the Wampanoag power structure is, is like a leaking ship. And even if one hole can be plugged, another one springs up. All it takes is one guy out for himself. Plymouth legitimizes him in their eyes. A sale of land is made, and it's over. And this is just a more egregious version of earlier ways that the Plymouth Colony were able to manipulate native leaders and sneak away a little more land or a little more privilege to that land than the native leader agreeing to it probably initially believed. And no one is more prominent in this role than a man by the name of John Sassaman, who we met in our last episode. He's a Wampanoag man who grew up in a Christian Wampanoag community. His parents died when he was quite young from a plague, and he actually grew up in an English household. He attended Harvard University before the Indian College was even built and was educated alongside the current leaders of the Plymouth Colony. Truth be told, he was probably more English in culture than Wampanoag. Being a prominent and well-connected man between the worlds, he married fairly well. He married King Philip's niece, a niece through King Philip's sister, so a maternal relation which in the clan systems of New England meant far more than being related to somebody even through marriage on your father's side. And so being quite close to King Philip and his brother before him, King Alexander, and a Wampanoag man, and a literate Wampanoag man, of which there weren't many at the time, he was trusted to facilitate land sales for the family of Osemaquin, the father of King Philip and Alexander. King Philip couldn't read and so while these land sales on the Wampanoag side were verbal, on the English side they were written. And Philip really depended on John Sassaman to tell him what the written version actually says. And that's when the loyalty of John Sassaman comes into question. Because some of these land sales are very generous. Everything comes to a head in this relationship when King Philip has a son. And he wants to make a will in writing to submit to the court of Plymouth specifying that his son is his heir. Naturally, he goes to John Sassaman to draft this will. He comes to find out, we're not exactly sure how, probably through another Wampanoag who had some level of literacy, that John Sassaman did not put Philip's son in as his heir. He put John Sassaman as the heir of King Philip. Yes, John Sassaman would be an in-law nephew on the maternal side, so there is a vague and weak claim of legitimacy there. But Philip specifically wanted his son to be his heir. When Philip discovers this, John Sassman runs away, back to a Christian native village where King Philip has no power. And in the intervening years, he works as a school teacher and minister among the Christian Wampanoag. He facilitates generous deals between other native leaders and the English. And now I'm done with all the prelude because moving right into the year of the war, 1675 in January. John Sassaman travels to Plymouth to the home of Josiah Winslow and tells him 
that King Philip is organizing the sachems for a general war against the English. Sassaman offered this information freely, did not seek any sort of reward, and expressed fear that just coming to Josiah could be detrimental to his health and well-being. Well, Sassaman was quite right in his assessment of his situation, because moving into February of 1675, poor John Sassaman was found dead under the thin ice of a lake in the Plymouth Colony. Immediately, rumors of foul play went about the colony. And as a known enemy of King Philip, Philip and his associates became natural suspects. Whether on true suspicion or an opportunity for more land grabs as a result of fines that would result, or a combination of both factors. So King Philip was called to the Plymouth Court in February, and initially King Philip was hesitant to show up, as he was before and his brother before him. He's quoted as saying, Your governor is but a subject of King Charles I. I shall not treat with a subject. I shall treat of peace only with the king, my brother. When he comes, I am ready. Quite a statement. Nevertheless, King Philip does show up at the Plymouth Court within the month of February, where authorities were unwilling or unable to extract any sort of statement of guilt from King Philip. And they were certainly unwilling to put him on trial for that crime. Essentially leaving them nowhere to go, King Philip was free to leave without fine or punishment. But as soon as King Philip left, a few Christian Wampanoag came forward. Again, about half the Wampanoag now are Christian, who claim they witnessed poor John's end and they knew who had murdered John Sassaman. The Christian Wampanoag urged the people of Plymouth to unbury Sassaman's body and inspect it. And then sure enough, the Plymouth authorities reported that John Sassaman's neck had been broken. He didn't die of hypothermia. His neck was snapped and then he was placed under the ice to make it look like an accident. The supposed witnesses pointed out three Wampanoag perpetrators. A man by the name of Matashananamo, another man by the name of Tobias, and Tobias' son, Wampa Pakwin, who was just a young boy. All three, including the boy, would be on trial for the murder of John Sassaman, and complicating the matter, the two adult men were known associates of King Philip. So was this an ordered hit? Let's throw this all out on the table. You have John visiting Josiah, not a month before, worried about his life and revealing some information about King Philip, coupled with at least 10 to 15 years of growing mistrust between John Sassaman and the family of King Philip. So there's motive, there's plenty of motive. You have eyewitnesses coming forward, claiming that they witnessed the murder and could identify the murderers. However, later there would be a report that indicated that the Christian Wampanoag were only claiming to have seen the murder as a way of endearing themselves to Plymouth authority. However, even if that were true, when they exhumed poor John, his neck was indeed broken. So it does appear that somebody murdered John Sassaman. And no matter what the exact truth may be, it was these three individuals identified by the Christian Wampanoag who would stand trial. As you can imagine, this caused tensions to rise in the Plymouth Colony and in all of southern New England. Because the unspoken implication here was that if these associates of King Philip were found guilty, it was by proxy a condemnation of the man himself. And during the trial, there were reports of what is recorded as strange Indians wandering around Mount Hope. Strange at the time meaning foreign or unknown to somebody. Not strange in the sense of that they're odd in some way, but that they were unrecognizable. The fear was that King Philip was looking to strike during this trial and bringing in distant warriors from his tributaries and his allies far beyond the reach of the Plymouth Colony. The jury consisted of 12 Englishmen, and six Native Americans, probably again from the Christian Wampanoag community. Sometimes it's described as if the Englishmen were the jury and the six Native Americans were consultants to the jury. Nonetheless, the people of Plymouth tried to include the Native Americans in this trial, if for no other reason a token sign of respect. 
Getting to the point, all three were found guilty and sentenced to hang. A sermon was given and down went the three with the rope. However, the young boy, his rope snapped or slipped depending on the account. Now there are certain times and certain places and certain cultures where such a thing happening is an opportunity for that convicted person to have what we would call today an appeal. And if we're real with ourselves, I don't think the people at Plymouth were comfortable with killing a child. At least not yet. Give it just a couple months. But at this point, it's likely that the rope was intended to fail. If you think about it, two grown men and their ropes don't snap, but a young boy weighing just a couple stone, that's too much for the rope to bear? I'm not convinced. The boy pleaded for his life, admitted the crimes that he committed, his father committed, and his associate. And believe it or not, the people of Plymouth allowed the boy to live. At least for now. I'm going to tell you right now, don't get too attached to him, nor any other child in this story. Now, as a result of this trial, the spring of 1675 saw the Wampanoag move away diplomatically from the people of Plymouth, break off communication. The sightings of these strange Indians would be on the increase. Rumor of King Philip growing ever closer to the Narragansett ruled the day and everybody knew something was going to happen. From the Wampadog point of view, as we will see at the end of this war, from the testimony of an elder chief, rather than King Philip being this man who had been meticulously planning this uprising for decades and had spearheaded the promotion of this idea and the collection of weapons from about 1671 right until the spring of 1675 it had been the young men the young warriors who wanted to prove themselves with feats of bravery and who wanted to right the wrongs that had been committed against their people that had been pushing for war with the english king philip became their figurehead and in 1675 with nearly all of his land sold with the jurisdiction of Plymouth now hovering over his own head, he was at a point where he could no longer play lip service to these young men. It was time to do what a sachem needed to do at times, provide and protect his people, even if that meant going to war. Now, from the English point of view, including the colony of Plymouth and Rhode Island especially, the cooler heads realized we can't summon Medicament, King Philip, to the court of Plymouth anymore. He's not going to be coming at this point. And so the English did take some effort to reach out to King Philip and other powerful sachems that are, were either allied with him or subservient to him. One of these colonial authorities would be Deputy Governor John Easton of the Rhode Island Colony, who had a very different relationship with the Wampanoag and the Narragansett than the people of Plymouth. It's from John Easton's account of what happens during his visit that we find out that those Christian Wampanoag may have made up their witness account as a way to appease or please the English. John Easton would actually be a fairly impartial viewer of the events that were going on. While close to them, he was not part of the jury, not part of the Plymouth colony, doesn't seem to side with the English over the Wampanoag over the Narragansett. In fact, Rhode Island has had plenty of issues with Plymouth, and so with far more ease than anyone from Plymouth, John Easton was able to go to King Philip, who granted him an audience when seemingly no other Englishman could. Easton urged Philip to go to the general courts of Plymouth and Massachusetts and work through differences in a civil manner. It doesn't have to come to war. King Philip responded that there can be no fair arbitration in New England courts, specifically because in these courts, the testimony of one native outdoes the testimony of 20 if that one party sides with English interests. Ultimately, Philip said, well, maybe I'd be willing to talk if we would get the government of New York involved. Not a New England colony and well known for their fair relationship, at least at this point, with the Haudenosaunee. But even this intimate, friendly conversation between non-combatants seems to have pushed King Philip to a resolution. Based on the records, it appears that John Easton went back for a second conversation with King Philip in June, where he made it quite clear that he intended to bring war down upon the English. And he even specified his reasons. King Philip cited the use of alcohol, 
by the English, plying it to the natives in order to get them to buy land cheap while intoxicated. King Philip noted the English cattle that trampled Native American corn and how the English refused to pen up their cows. Many native leaders noted the sale of liquor to their younger braves, thus making them uncontrollable by the elders. King Philip mentioned the overreach of the jurisdiction of Plymouth, the murder of his brother, the betrayal of his trust, the trust of his brother, the trust of his father, Osamaquin, who could have snuffed out the Plymouth settlers at their root decades ago, but instead chose a fair and generous path a path that seems to be now closed in King Philip's mind. Now, these are all legitimate, well-thought-out, good reasons to war with someone, I have to admit. And after the war, when a Wampanoag elder will blame the young braves and their desire to go warring against the English for having pushed King Philip into war with the English, we have to note right here that King Philip, Medicament, Pometicomet, however you want to say his name, may not have been the weak leader being pushed around by the youth of his people, but again had legitimate reasons in his own family and concerning the well-being of all of his people to go to war with the English. So certainly by the end of spring into June of 1675, King Philip is most certainly planning his attack on the English. I know I'm being repetitive here. What's interesting to note is that the specific nation of Wampanoag that King Philip is this local sachem for is the Poconoket Nation, who collectively only made up about 5% of the Native American population in New England. Now, King Philip, however great as he may be, with at least nominal control over half of the existing Wampanoag population, the non-Christian population, that collective does not equal anything close to a general uprising against the English. But as we mentioned in the last episode, King Philip had tributaries to the West and Northwest, and he angered some of the Narragansett leadership because he was pulling away influence from various Narragansett sachems as the two people started to overlap and blend to a greater degree than they ever had before. Now, many of these young Narragansett men, just like the Wampanoag men, they wanted to war with the English. And so right from the beginning in June of 1675, while the Narragansett sachems officially remained aloof, neutral, for a short while at least anyway, many of the young men had already moved into King Philip's camp. One young man who witnessed this movement of the Native Americans, this sudden realignment coalescing behind King Philip, was Ben Church, who was the grandson of a Mayflower pilgrim. So he's third generation. Again, around Thanksgiving, King Philip's War often comes up as a an example of the pilgrims going back on their treaties with the Wampanoag. But we're really talking about the second and mostly the third generation doing the fighting in this war. Remember, 1675 is 54 years after the 1621 treaty with the Wampanoag. Ben Church lived near the Sakonet Nation of Native Americans. He knew the people of that nation quite well. And so in the spring, much like the deputy governor of Rhode Island, he went to the Sakonets to inquire about these rumors, where he spoke to his old friend, the squaw sachem Awashanks, who he can tell is quite shaken by something. Not only is, yes, Philip is going to war with the English, but the young men of her nation are being pulled away from her to join King Philip at Mount Hope. And as if that isn't enough, Awashanks was being pressured to join Philip officially, to bring her nation in the fullest sense into this conflict on the side of King Philip and his Wampanoag. And when the war broke out, if she were not to join the Wampanoag, Awashunks had already been forewarned that they would carry out attacks on the outskirts of her territory to her neighboring English and bring her people in the fullest sense into the war through mere association. She asked Ben Church for uh, the protection of the Plymouth colony which is something he could not promise. And so he head off to Josiah Winslow's house, hoping to secure some sort of satisfaction for poor Awashanks. On his way there, he also passed through the Pocasset Wampanoag Nation, where he spoke to the great squaw sachem Witamo, who was the widow of King Alexander, the brother of King Philip, and thus King Philip's sister-in-law, where he found a nearly identical scene happening in this nation. Witamo, like Awashanks, 
like many of the Narragansett sachems, had lost the confidence of her young warriors, and they were quickly on their way to King Philip at Mount Hope. Wiedemo was unsure of what she should do. She didn't want to get involved in this conflict. However, the bonds of kinship to Philip and his allies ran very deep. If you remembered back to our second episode on the Wampanoag, Wiedemo was married off to King Alexander. Meanwhile, Wiedemo's younger sister was married off to King Philip. The family being intertwined after Wiedemo's father, Corbitant, tried to overthrow Osemaquin. In their peace deal, their children would be married to one another. Ben Church advised her to go to Rhode Island, the actual island of Rhode Island. Get off the continent. Get far away from your double brother-in-law. That'll save you from his Wampanoag, but also disassociate yourself from them to such a degree that you'll be safe from English retribution. The problem is, in the, the prelude to the war and in the opening phase of the war, Wiedemo tries to go to Rhode Island otherwise known as Aquid Neck Island. But the English there, already weary of her, twice sent her canoe back to the mainland. And so, what position is this poor woman in? All of her warriors have abandoned her. Her people are scattered. She twice sought refuge among the English who outright rejected her. She had to join Philip. And now everything is set. We have our battle lines. People have chosen their sides. Native nations have already been uprooted to align themselves appropriately. And King Philip has already let it be known he intends to bring war upon the English. The Puritan went to their churches and prayed to their god. The Wampanoag consulted their Pawas, the powerful shaman who could commune with the spirits of the underworld, chief among them being Habamak, sometimes known as Cheapy. And they advised King Philip that the spirits informed them that the natives could only win this war if it were the English who drew first blood. The Wampanoag, eager for war, realized that the English needed to be provoked. And so beginning Sunday, June 20th, 1675, the Wampanoag began killing livestock, burning houses, and robbing property where they could. One of the central focal points for the Wampanoag and their raids during this small tight period of time from the 20th to the 23rd was the village of Swansea, then part of the Plymouth colony, now of course part of the state of Massachusetts. Now the adult English in Swansea, they took three days of these raids without striking back violently, perhaps sensing that they were being provoked. However, it would be a boy by the name of John Salisbury who shot a Wampanoag warrior running away from his family farm after having robbed it, killing the man and prompting the people of Swansea to concentrate inside of their stronghouse. Realizing what the boy perhaps did not put together, which was, now the Wampanoag aren't coming after our cattle and our structures, they're going to be coming after us. Nathaniel Philbrick on his book on Plymouth said that, the boy had given the warriors exactly what they wanted the go-ahead to kill. The Wampanoag descended upon the settlers, killing at least 10. They scalped a few people. They left a few alive just to bleed out. The local garrison was ordered not to leave the blockhouse and instead wait for reinforcements. They were of no help. And at the end of the day, the dead included the unfortunate boy who drew first blood. Right here from the beginning, uh, it is noted that the Wampanoag did not distinguish this time between men, women, and children at least not in some of these early engagements, which would only enable the English to do the same when it came time for their counterattacks. Keep that in mind. After this, Philip's warriors immediately began or attempted to conduct a siege of the garrison in their blockhouse. And on the roadways around Swansea, they had littered mutilated English body parts about the road to strike fear in their enemies. As horrifying as all of this is, one of the weaknesses that King Philip has, which is shared among many native leaders along the uh, east coast of North America, is that he was unable to hold an effective siege. The English, more than willing to stay to hold up somewhere on the defense, other than a couple opportunistic shots at one another, the natives were unable to dislodge the garrison. Now, if your goal was truly to remove the English from this part of the continent, the country would be easy to depopulate, but concentrated sections of English populations behind fences and walls 
and along the coast with access to the sea, as much as modern fans of history like to degrade colonial fighters and their inability to match natives in guerrilla-type warfare, the natives were not good at this type of warfare, really committing to uprooting someone from a well-defended spot. Raiding does not lend itself to this end. Very quickly before the end of the month, Massachusetts and Plymouth would create a combined force. The garrison at Swansea would be relieved, which brings us to, again, the weakness of the English colonial fighters, at least those with experience in European warfare. They kept trying to get the Wampanoag into an open field pitch battle, and they kept trying to use pincer-like movements of their troops to isolate King Philip to a small neck of land somewhere, somewhere they could hem him in. But King Philip and his warriors moved faster than any collection of English militia, and suspecting that Philip went back to Mount Hope, when they came bearing down on the area, they found nothing but English bodies mutilated along the way, the damage already being done and King Philip nowhere in sight. In fact, he had slipped right by them, and instead of containing this uprising by forcing King Philip into a corner, they only managed to concentrate themselves. Meanwhile, King Philip, the Wampanoag, under his command, and his allies escaped without a trace navigating the swamps, which the English had little knowledge of, and had their pick of English settlements in southern New England to exact vengeance upon for decades of perceived mistreatment. Perhaps I'm beating a dead horse here, but as a teacher, I like to highlight certain themes like this. This opening episode of the war highlights quite effectively the defects of both sides. One side is slow, but determined and concentrated with a wealth of reserves and support, although sometimes far distant. The other side is more desperate, faster, perhaps individually more brave, but collectively less unified, with support close at hand, but being close at hand, easily found and destroyed, especially in regards to stores of food, fields of food, and while again they're quick to attack, they're not entirely resolved to attack hard targets and keep attacking those same targets, even though the effort might be extremely difficult. Shortly after this opening episode, the Narragansett meet with authorities from the New England Confederation, which at this time would be Massachusetts, Plymouth, and Connecticut, to ask why Connecticut and Massachusetts joined a conflict which only involved truly Plymouth. The colonial authorities responded that they were all under one king, and that King Philip a pledge subordinate to the English king was in open rebellion, and thus, all the colonies were coming down upon him. We don't have the internal reaction to this information that the Narragansett leadership felt at this moment, but Native Americans of the Northeast often saw these sort of political relationships in terms of chains or links, and when there were levels, a hierarchy involved in other words, they saw relationships in terms of brother to brother, father to son. It would not surprise me if this conversation reminded the Narragansett sachems of their own responsibilities to the interrelated families of the Wampanoag sachems, and they may have already resigned themselves to war with the English at the opportune moment. But publicly anyway, the Narragansett pledged that they had no allegiance, no alliance with King Philip. But they did accuse Uncas of the Mohegan of secretly forming league with King Philip. This would be a strange and perhaps desperate lie on the part of the Narragansett who have long hated Uncas and his Mohegans, as Uncas had been an ally of the English since the 1630s. Getting up there in age now, he had a stellar record of constantly supporting and being on the side of the English. And sparing no time, Uncas delivered onto the New England Confederation, that is Plymouth, Massachusetts, and Connecticut at this point, his own sons to demonstrate his allyship with the English, along with a number of his warriors and 50 of his people's women. Also on the side of the English, if we take a trip out to our islands of Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket, the Wampanoag who lived on those islands, now firmly Christian, and having a more trustworthy relationship with the English on the islands than the Puritan English on the mainland, were eager to remind the English of their breaking of any connection to Philip and his Wampanoag years ago, and of their committed friendship between themselves and the English. On Martha's Vineyard, Governor Mayhew, 
rejected the suggestion of the mainland governors to disarm the Wampanoag on the island, the population of which was 1,500. But the two groups had so much trust in one another, what happened on the mainland wasn't going to happen on Martha's Vineyard. Similarly, on Nantucket, the natives there, on their own, volunteered to hand over their weapons to the English and publicly disown King Philip. And with that, just a large part of the total Wampanoag population, those who are ethnically Wampanoag, to use a modern term, were not actually part of King Philip's war. And if anything, they would end up siding with the English. Now, the English on the main, they invaded and destroyed Poconoket. Philip and his people escaped by taking canoes to Pocasset. And from there, Philip escaped the clutches of the English and made it all the way to Nipmuc country. Whereas normally, Philip dressed himself ornately, richly even, and made it very clear visually that he was no ordinary Wampanoag, but a chief of the Wampanoag. He now dressed in plain clothes and cut his hair. Almost from the beginning, Philip is on the run. Bradford takes over a hundred Wampanoag captive over 12 days in July, which would include some members of Philip's extended family. And of course, in addition to destroying the Poconoket village, they uprooted thousands of acres of native corn. And they were even quick enough on the heels of Philip to obtain one of his hats and one of his horses, which they kept as trophies. Historians often criticize the New Englanders for being slow during this war, slow to move around, that is. But in reality, there were several instances, even at the beginning of the war, when the English were right on the tail of Philip, who, of course, was just a little bit faster at running away than the English were at chasing him. But at this point, Philip even evades the native allies of the English, such as the Mohegan. The English decide to build a fort at Poconoket and wait out the return of Philip to his land. Eventually, they would be disheartened to learn that Philip had no intention of returning to Poconoket to attack a fort. And the heavy-handed English response between July and August of 1675 pushed many of these undeclared native communities over to Philip's side. This would include his former sister-in-law, Witamo, or Witamu. As mentioned before, she desperately tried to avoid getting involved in this war. However, her braves seemed to have made the decision for her, as well as her new husband, the Narragansett Sachem Quinnipin, has a kin relation by the name of Quiapin, who starts to meticulously build a stone fort, anticipating the Narragansett entry into the war. Witamo, for her part, led the Wampanoag women and children through the swamps that the English could not navigate and successfully hid them among the people of her husband, the Narragansett, first heading north and then west, and then went out of sight of the English, suddenly going south. It's during this phase of the war that Ben Church, not yet the military leader he will become, and others criticized the English commanders for their inaction. Instead of continuing to give chase, they dug in, much as the English are inclined to do at this time, because that is a strength they have. But you can't defeat a fleeing enemy if you're not willing to go after them. Again, we see the, the flaws of both the English and Native American forms of warfare. Neither side was able to end this war in a two-month span of time. And now let's follow Philip as he heads towards Nipmuc country. The Connecticut General Court records the appearance of the Wampanoag walking through the outskirts of the Connecticut colony. People noticed in horror as the Wampanoag were wearing the appendages and body parts of dead men from Plymouth as trophies and jewelry. Indeed, Swansea was just the beginning. The Wampanoag also took out New Bedford, Taunton, Middleborough, all before the end of July 1675. Now, the Nipmuc are a curious case. Much like the Wampanoag communities, their allegiances could have been split, as there were segments of the Nipmuc which at times were tributaries to the Wampanoag, specifically Osemaquin and probably King Alexander. Meanwhile, the Nipmuc had moved closer to the English in the Massachusetts Bay Colony in response to raids that were conducted by the Mohegan and the Mohawk against them. But as time wore on, the Nipmuc had very similar problems uh, as did the Wampanoag to the English, and especially with the Massachusetts Bay Colony, who had many more times the people as Plymouth, the people of Massachusetts desired land. The Nipmuc had that land. And so when the great King Philip showed up at their doorstep, 
Having already started a war with the English of Plymouth, the Nipmuc were quick to seize the opportunity, and they attacked the settlement of Menden, Massachusetts. All of this despite their earlier claim to maintain a neutrality. Now, the Nipmuc appeared to have between 500 to 600 warriors in total split between three sachems who collectively governed over the Nipmuc people. These numbers seem small, but at the end of the day, if you really looked at the numbers here and the damage done, it appears that the Nipmuc sachems were far more effective in warfare than King Philip himself. And I believe the same will be said of the Narragansett when they enter the war. Moving into August of 1675, a certain Captain Mosley burns the villages of the Penacook, which would be in modern-day New Hampshire, to the ground, despite the Penacook being, by all outward appearances, friendly up to this point. And again, the heavy hand of the English pushes more and more natives over to Philip's side. Now, I keep saying Philip's side, but he doesn't seem to be in command of anyone else other than the people in his immediate party. Every native nation is acting on its own for a common cause. Philip himself and his people still running. Specifically, they want to get to the west. Philip believed that he could still obtain supplies from the river Indians. This would be a term that would describe the Algonquian people who lived on the Hudson River, such as the Wappinger. He also hoped that he could make contact with the French up in New France and their native allies, who could specifically supply him guns and powder and shot. But on August 1st, 1675, a combined force of Mohegans and English intercept Philip's forces, capturing 55 and killing 30. Now, other sources say that 23 were killed. The timeline is muddled, but this seems to be the point where the aforementioned Wiedemo decisively turned her flock south and Philip fled up to the Nipmuc. A day later, a diplomatic party from Massachusetts sought to establish negotiations with the Nipmuc, only to be attacked by them, and the survivors ran to the town of Brookfield, which only opened up the opportunity for the Nipmuc to lay siege to the town for a full day until reinforcements arrived and chased off the Nipmuc warriors. After this, as if Massachusetts hasn't shot itself in the foot enough yet, the Massachusetts General Court demands that the natives, within what they perceive to be their colony, hand over their guns. Now, those reinforcements to Brookfield were led by one William Hutchinson. The siege eventually lifted, but William Hutchinson is mortally wounded. From this point on, central Massachusetts is an open buffet for native attacks all throughout August. And in this arena, anyway, the Nipmuc seem very much in charge of the native response to the English. In addition to harboring Philip, their own neighbors to the west, the Pakamtucks join in on the opportunity to raid English settlements. I say opportunities, but especially on the uh, Massachusetts frontier of this war, I don't want it to seem opportunistic in the sense that these native groups are attacking women and children in villages or people in their beds, because it's during September of 1675 that we see a number of native groups going directly at English militiamen. The force under Captain Beers were brutally attacked between September 3rd and 4th, killing 21 of his men. Then later in September, on the 18th to be precise, as the people were fleeing Deerfield from the Nipmuc and a few of their allies, the natives caught up to them as they were trying to forge a stream, killing 57 of them. One Captain Mosley, having heard the carnage, came to the rescue of the residents of Deerfield, and instead of the natives running away, fleeing as one would in a stereotypical guerrilla-style ambush, the Nipmuc and their allies stood their ground and fought, killing 64 of Mosley's men. There were so many dead in the stream, this event became known as the Battle of Bloody Brook. And indeed, before we head back south and check in on the Narragansett, every single Massachusetts town along the Connecticut River was attacked over the course of this war, some towns several times, to the point where towns were abandoned. And not to be repetitive or drive a point home too sharply, despite where this war began, I think there's a, a decent argument to be made that you could call this the Nipmuc War just as much as you could call it King Philip's War. But now back in Narragansett country, Wiedemo and her people are hidden among the swamps, along with the aforementioned Awashanks and her Wampanoag people. And the Narragansett at this point are content to maintain a neutral status, outwardly friendly to the English, or at least not hostile, 
while also being neutral in the sense that they are harboring the non-combatants of the Wampanoag people. But rumors have leaked out, and New England officials travel to the Narragansett, and they demand answers to these rumors, one of which was that they were harboring Weetimo and the Wampanoag women and children. Is this true? The Narragansett deny such an allegation and are actually able to deliver up heads, heads that supposedly belong to Philip's warriors, to demonstrate that indeed they had been killing any of Philip's men who had wandered into their territory. At one point, colonial officials become convinced that yes, Wiedemo and her people are in fact in Narragansett country, and they again ask the Narragansett sachems, is she there as a guest or as a captive? And then finally pressing the Narragansett further, they make it clear that peace between the two peoples could only be maintained if the Narragansett were to hand over the Wampanoag women and children. The Narragansett agree to do so on the future date of October 28th. Well, October 28th came and went without delivery. Suspicion at an all-time high in Plymouth and Massachusetts, even the Christian native communities having no affiliation with Philip or the Narragansett or the Nipmuc come under suspicion. And there are talks to remove them to camps where their movements could be watched. Many of the Cape Wampanoag spend October of 1675 traveling to Plymouth, that is the capital of the colony, the Cape itself already within the domain of the Plymouth colony, and explicitly pledge their support for Plymouth and promise to in no way support the actions of Philip and his faction of Wampanoag. Now this is where things get dicey, because during the same time 150 Wampanoag surrender to the Plymouth garrison, believed to have been from the warring faction of the Wampanoag. Men like John Elliot believed that surrendering Wampanoag should be baptized and then killed, at least in an attempt to save their souls, which they considered a better option to what the Plymouth Colony did, which is sell them into slavery to faraway places like the Caribbean, as was done with various local rulers in Africa and their captives. You take a and you turn the scenario around, you sell them into slavery, you make a profit, and you depopulate your enemy. The key here being that the location of where they would be enslaved would be far enough away that they would never make their way back. Of the 150 who surrendered, 149 were sold into slavery specifically. One man was deemed too old to be worth sale or to survive the journey, and he was simply decapitated. Now, even the groups who made it very clear that they were Christian, natives, no friend of Philip, and longtime ally to the English, again face the threat of relocation. John Elliot, the aforementioned missionary who preferred the non-Christian natives be baptized and murdered to being sold into slavery but allowed to live, came to the defense of these Christian natives, many of them Wampanoag. And especially those praying cities in the Massachusetts colony, the natives there were to be relocated somewhere. But as negotiations went on, no English population wanted the Christian natives anywhere near them. John Elliot helped prevent them all from being sold far away, but instead it was resolved to take all of these friendly natives and relocate them onto Deer Island, with a few being sent elsewhere. But Deer Island was a small spit of land in Boston Harbor, and there were perhaps as many as 1,100 people relocated to overwinter on a cold island on the Atlantic Ocean. This will prove to not be a pleasant season for the inhabitants of John Elliot's former praying towns. Several days after the decision to relocate these natives to Deer Island is decided upon, on October 5th, Springfield is attacked. Of the 75 houses in the town, 62 of them are destroyed. The Nipmuc follow this up and they take native Christians prisoner in the chaos of their relocation. Perhaps a mistake, as several of these native Christians will work as spies for the Massachusetts colonial government after gaining the trust of their captors. Back to the South on November 12th, the New England Confederation, otherwise known as the United Colonies of New England, that would be Connecticut, Plymouth, and Massachusetts, agree to raise an additional 1,000 troops to invade Narragansett country, as they took the refusal to hand over Wiedemo and her people as a declaration of war. Now moving into the deep winter of this first year of the war, I think it's pretty clear 
that everything has grown beyond the control of King Philip. Even the perceived side that he is on is not led by Philip. He is one of many leaders, and at many points in this war, he's not even the most powerful of among equals. But being the one who started this war, he obtained an infamy that attached his name to every attack, no matter where it was, no matter who undertook it. To quote the historian Nathaniel Philbrick, By November, Philip had become an almost mythic figure in the imagination of the Puritans, who saw his hand in every burning house and lifeless English body. At the same time, getting a bit of a reality check here, Nathaniel Philbrick also says, Philip was certainly not the mastermind behind the coordinated plan of native attack. Indeed, there are no documented instances of his having been present at a single battle in the fall of 1675. This all makes Philip seem like a ghost, like he had ceased being a real person. And yet he was. What was he doing during this time? After he fled the battle against the English and the Mohegans, and after his sojourn to the Nipmuc, because the English were still very much concerned with tracking down that one specific individual. They believed that his capture would lead to the end of hostilities. Again, the English already had an aggrandized view of Philip that even the Native Americans didn't have. Indeed, if you read the various diaries and journals from the time or the, the sermons that were given out in the churches during this time, some of the Puritans in their worldview begin to see Philip as judgment as punishment by God for their sins. Truly spooked, shaken to the core. As a result, they continued trying to root out Philip himself and disarming natives who weren't part of the conflict. To the far north, as I mentioned, the Penacook earlier were just the first of several groups that would eventually become part of the Wabanaki Confederacy, many of the future members of which, by the winter of 1675, had now turned on the sparse English population and what we would now call New Hampshire and Maine. And over the next six months or so, historians often use the word depopulation, referring to the fact that many of the seeds planted in our earlier episodes on the Maine colony were completely uprooted during this time. As wide a swath as 60 miles of coastline north of Massachusetts would not have an English population by the end of this war. And where is Philip? Where is he in the ending days of 1675? Well, there are some sources that suggest that he did in fact manage to meet up with officials from New France. But if you search the archives of Canada, of New France, of Quebec, of Montreal, you won't find mention of this meeting. Well, France and England at the time were at peace with one another. That didn't stop each other from aiding the enemies of the other, but they had to be quiet about it. So it's quite possible that this meeting actually occurred, and the reports vary, but according to one, the officials of New France offered King Philip 300 native allies, powder and shot. If only Philip could find a way to be in receipt of these men and supplies some months from now. And so with his men, separate from the Nipmuc and Weedamo and Awashunks, who had the bulk of the Wampanoag Nation, his braves camped somewhere near the Hudson River Valley. Most historians put the place of his winter encampment near Scaticoke. Along this ancient passageway to the north, Philip would have a tenuous line of communication through Lake Champlain to the Richelieu River to the St. Lawrence. And there we are, we're in New France. And then over winter, Philip planned to entice the Mohawk of the Haudenosaunee to join in on his cause. Now, the Iroquois, or Haudenosaunee, it's a group we haven't focused on since season one of this podcast. In fact, they were our very first subject. The Wampanoag and Mohawk had maintained a shaky peace, the Wampanoag being allied with the English at Plymouth, at least up until this year, and the Iroquois almost always having easier targets to go after. But perhaps unknown to Philip, the Iroquois and the Mohawk specifically, as the eastern door of the Longhouse, transferred that trading relationship they had with the Dutch in New Netherland to the new New York colony. And in fact, the connection between the colony and the Haudenosaunee were still these Dutch traders who developed a sort of merchant cabal in Albany, New York. Philip was probably not aware of how deeply that relationship ran. Also, the New York colony 
was not of a size and geographic scope that it had yet to become abusive towards the Mohawk in terms of land grabs. If Philip was looking for a new ally here, he was barking up the wrong tree. Governor Edmund Andros of New York, who will come to know well in this podcast season, he tells the Mohawk about King Philip, informs them of the whereabouts of his winter encampment, and it becomes known that Philip is trying to align himself with the French natives. That is, the natives who align themselves with the French in New France. The Iroquois had become mortal enemies of the people of New France and their native allies. And over the winter, these mortal enemies had been trickling into Philip's camp. Perhaps as many as 600, King Philip met with the Mohawk and presented them with 300 fathoms of wampum. But the Mohawk only agreed to provide supplies and to plan a future attack on the Mohegans. They would not show any aggression against any English colony. Furthermore, Philip became implicated in a plot to drive the Mohawk natives towards attacking the English. What Philip decided to do was kill a few Mohawk natives and then blame it, of course, on an English settler. This was in February of 1676. However, in Philip's attack, not every Mohawk was killed, and at least one made it back home and told the tale of Philip's treachery. In response, in late February of 1676, the Mohawk in one swoop fell upon Philip's camp, killing many in a single raid and scattering all of Philip's people, while also managing to capture a few of Philip's men to march into Albany to put on display along with the scalps of Philip's dead warriors. Some historians who highlight the indigenous efforts in King Philip's war, they like to emphasize that perhaps this one single attack by another native group, the Mohawk, did more damage to Philip's plight than anything else. As it was an attack, not on the Nipmuc, not on the Narragansett or the Penacook, but on King Philip himself, and it prevented Philip from receiving the promised aid from the French. To quote the historian Nathaniel Philbrick, on the condition of King Philip at this point. Sick, desperate, and fast becoming irrelevant to the war he started. And indeed, what of the people that he is now so far away from? What, what's going on with them this winter? Well, the force raised by the New England Confederation invaded the colony of Rhode Island without permission in order to strike quickly at the Narragansett. The Narragansett, for their part, had destroyed the mainland of the Rhode Island colony despite Rhode Island not participating in the war, at least until this point. There's one sad episode wherein the residents of Providence had long since escaped to Ackwood Neck Island, with the exception of Roger Williams himself. Now an old man, the Narragansett, found him alone in his house. They had him removed from that house, and Roger Williams reminded them of the deep friendship that he had with Canonicus and the various leaders of the Narragansett people over the many previous decades. But now we come to a point where the Narragansett drew a hard line. You are English. We are Narragansett. You are my enemy. And Providence is put to the torch, including Roger Williams' house. His trading post was also destroyed, and Roger Williams spends his few remaining years in relative poverty. But now the English Confederate forces were searching the swamps. They were looking for Weedamo, Awashunks, they were looking for the Wampanoag people. They were specifically tracking down the women and children of those warriors fighting beside King Philip. And it is recorded that it was a Narragansett named Peter, so likely a Christian convert, who ultimately revealed the location of the women and children and then led the English right to them, finding a five-acre fort built on a dry patch in the middle of a large swamp. And there held almost a thousand people by most estimates, the bulk of which would be Wampanoag refugees, not men of fighting age. But among the thousand were Narragansett warriors tasked with protecting the heart and soul of the Wampanoag nation, not aligned with the English. In the brutal fight that followed, the English and their native allies didn't really differentiate between warriors and children and women, and estimates vary, but it would seem as if 300 warriors of the Narragansett were killed among 300 non-combatants. That would be women, children, and the elderly. 
the English completely overran the fort, had great loss, losing as much as 20% of their force, and scattered the survivors. Now, this is December of 1675. Now, it's not knowable, but you can imagine the survival rate of these people without shelter or food running and hiding through the swamps of Narragansett country in December. The biographer Ola Elizabeth Winslow, in her biography of John Eliot, says that the Great Swamp Fight was not a battle at all. It was a holocaust. Nevertheless, it proved a great victory for Josiah Winslow, and he remained in Narragansett country at least through the end of January. The Narragansett becoming quite desperate, their leadership dwindled to Kananchet and Quinnipin, who was the husband of Wiedemo. And at the end of January 1676, Josiah Winslow finds 60 horse heads north of Providence and concluded that the natives were now eating their horses out of desperation, seizing the opportunity. Winslow uses his forces to chase the Narragansett straight into Nipmuc country. This becomes known as the Hungry March, as Winslow ran the men until there was just about no food left. And so in early February, was forced to disband the remnants of the Confederate army. Now, what's important here to the Wampanoag and the other natives who are fighting the English is that the Narragansett, although now diminished, managed to outrun the English, who went home starving, and stayed relatively intact as refugees now in Nipmuc country. This is setting up a late winter of 1676 and early spring, where all the enemies of the English in southern New England are now concentrated in what is now modern-day central Massachusetts, and spend the rest of February just punishing the people of Massachusetts, attacking Lancaster, Weymouth, Medfield, mostly using guerrilla warfare tactics and getting out of there before the English could organize a response. By the end of the month, the Nipmuc, King Philip, the Narragansett, and all of the natives camped out in central Massachusetts feel so secure in their position, Philip reveals to Kananchet that he has a secret store of seed corn at Mount Hope. If only Kananchet could arrange a party to go and retrieve it, as there seems to be relative safety where they were, and they could plant crops now in the Connecticut River Valley. A wise thought on the part of Philip, where you have three or four native nations now inhabiting an area formerly inhabited by one nation. Food will be running out. And now I would like to turn to a primary source from the camp of Philip, Wiedemo, and Canonchet. Now remember, the only literate natives in New England at this time were Christian. They weren't going to be in King Philip's camp, right? But, but, during the Lancaster attack, they took a woman captive. Her name was Mary Rowlinson, and she did compose an account of her captivity. Not a native account, but then again, there is no first-hand account of this specific theater of the war from the native point of view. And even if we turn to the oral tradition, as we'll see by the end of this episode, the Wampanoag communities today, by and large, not completely, are composed of the descendants of the Wampanoags who did not fight with Philip. They weren't at the camp. And so now I turn to Mary Rowlinson, starting with the account of her being taken from her house. Some in our house were fighting for their lives, other wallowing in their blood. The house on fire over our heads, and the bloody heathen ready to knock us on the head if we stirred out. Now might we hear mothers and children crying out for themselves and for one another, Lord, what shall we do? Then I took my children and one of my sisters, to go forth and leave the house. But as soon as we came to the door and appeared, the Indians shot so thick that the bullets rattled against the house, as if one had taken a handful of stones and threw them, so that we were fain to give back. We had six stout dogs belonging to our garrison, but none of them would stir. Though another time, if any Indian had come to the door, they were ready to fly upon him and tear him down. The Lord hereby would make us the more acknowledged his hand, and to see that our help is always in him. But out we must go, the fire increasing, and coming along behind us roaring, and the Indians gaping before us, with their guns, spears, and hatchets to devour us. No sooner were we out of the house, but my brother-in-law, being before wounded and defending the house, in or near the throat, fell down dead, wherein the Indians scornfully shouted and hallowed, and were presently upon him, stripping off his clothes, the bullets flying thick. One went through my side, and the same as it would seem, through the bowels and hand of my dear child in my arms. One of my elder sister's children named William 
had then his leg broken, which the Indians perceiving, they knocked him on his head. Thus we were butchered by those merciless heathen, standing amazed, with blood running down our heels. My eldest sister, being yet in the house, and seeing those woeful sights, the infidels hauling mothers one way, and children another, and some wallowing in their blood, and her elder son telling her that her son William was dead, and myself was wounded, she said, and Lord let me die with them, which was no sooner said, but she was struck with a bullet and fell down dead over the threshold. Quite an account so far. Now I know we've spent over an hour now focusing on King Philip's side of the war, trying to see things from their perspective. And it might come as a shock to some modern listeners to hear terms like heathen and a woman talking so negatively about a people that we've been following around. However, this is a woman who's having her children killed, her community massacred, and herself being taken captive. We must allow her some room to be angry at the people who are killing her family, right? I think we can do that. And her account isn't completely full of vitriol, as we'll see from little snippets here on out, but why it is important, strip away all the judgments she might put into it, all the feelings. During her many days in captivity, she kept track of the date because she always wanted to observe the Sabbath. As such, every time the natives moved camp, she made a record of it. And the accuracy of that record is been confirmed by the various attacks recorded by someone other than herself. And so she is, her diary anyway, is an invaluable resource into reconstructing the movements of Philip, Wiedemo, Kananchet, and the others. And in fact, it is to Wiedemo that Mary Rowlandson is given. And while Mary records that Philip and Quinnipin were fair in their dealings, Mary does not have good words about Wiedemo, who would beat Mary on occasion. And let's not forget that Mary did in fact still have one of her children who was wounded far worse than she was, spending her nights tending to her child as she could. She records, I sat much alone with a poor wounded child in my lap, which moaned night and day, having nothing to revive the body or cheer the spirit of her. But instead of that, sometimes one Indian would come and tell me one hour that your master will knock your child in the head. And then a second, and then a third, your master will quickly knock your child in the head. This was the comfort I had from them. Miserable comforters are ye all, as he said. Thus nine days I sat upon my knees, with my babe in my lap, till my flesh was raw again, my child being even ready to depart this sorrowful world. They bade me carry it out to another wigwam, I suppose because they would not be troubled with such spectacles. Whither I went with a very heavy heart, and I sat down with the picture of death in my lap. About two hours into the night, my sweet babe, like a lamb, departed this life on February 18th, 1675, being about six years and five months old. Again, many people who are reviewing Mary Rowlandson's account today, I, I've seen comments online that say, oh, she's, she's whining too much, or she's being insensitive to her native captors, or her writing is tainted from a white colonial point of view. To these criticisms, I just say, no, it doesn't matter. This is a woman who has been taking, taken captive. This woman is allowed to have negative feelings. And to use a modern term, this seems like victim shaming across the centuries. And she really is a victim of a war that she didn't start, or even really her colony of Massachusetts, which again in the spring of 1676 is just being ravaged. So much so that many in Massachusetts finally have a change of heart and they realize, well, let's take these neutral natives or these Christian natives and instead of punishing them and be suspicious, there's a sudden change in policy, probably having spent the last six months or so seeing the benefits of having native allies such as the Mohegan and the faraway Mohawk, they now begin to solicit these communities for help, for fighting men. But remember, many of these natives have been removed to Deer Island where all winter John Elliot and a companion of his named Daniel Gutkin, or Gukin rather, they did what they could for the natives there. And John Elliot actually faced death threats for helping them. The war had turned attitudes in New England from something we see in Mary Rowlandson's account, a Christian versus heathen, into the beginnings of something far more racial, where there was European or English versus native. And while natives were freezing and starving to death on Deer Island, John Elliot soliciting simple charity to help them 
had his life threatened for simply wanting to feed Christians. This much mirrors what we heard earlier with poor Roger Williams having his house burned to the ground, despite an unparalleled record of cooperation with the Narragansett. Things had turned racial, and yet almost paradoxically, or maybe out of sheer desperation, the Massachusetts Bay Colony began to fully embrace native allies against Philip. Pushing these neutral groups into the camp of the English would be the Mohawk and the Pequot, who now could have open season on any native groups that were fighting the English or remain neutral against the English. You want protection from the Mohawk? Well, you have to be an ally of an English colony. And so moving into March of 1676, it seems that poor Philip and his allies were actually the minority group among the Native American groups of Southern New England. If not from the very beginning, there were probably actually more natives who were neutral or on the side of the English at this point than on the side of Philip and his allies. Again, to call this a pan-native uprising against the English would be a, a big oversimplification. And again, even calling it King Philip's War is probably an oversimplification because in the spring of 1676, the real star of the natives standing out against the English is Kananchet, the man tasked with retrieving the seed corn from Mount Hope. Philip would remain in Nipmuc country in his attempt to be in receipt of supplies from the French and their natives. In this respect, he failed. And he failed because the Mohawk spent the spring raiding Philip's western flank from Connecticut all the way up into the modern-day northern border of Massachusetts, Kananchet. Meanwhile, he goes through an abandoned mainland Rhode Island and burns down entire towns. And on March 12th, Kananchet is three miles from the actual village of Plymouth, where he kills 11 settlers. He spends the month having just win after win. March 26th, he's back in Rhode Island, and he intercepts English troops. Again, Cannon Chet is not just picking off the low-hanging fruit. He's not going after women and children sleeping in their beds. He's going after English militia. And with his force of what is estimated to be 500 warriors, he overwhelms a group of militiamen under Captain Michael Pierce, taking survivors to torture to death. Two days later, somehow he has what's estimated to be 1,500 braves, and he attacks Rehoboth, then a town in the Plymouth Colony, now part of Massachusetts. And after the attack, not a town at all, as he only left two structures standing. And perhaps it was the native allies of the English who realized at this moment, forget about Philip. Philip is not the guy you want to get right now. It's Kananchet. And a small force of Pequot and English track Kananchet specifically. And they finally get him on April 9th, 1676. He's taken by surprise and he tries to flee, but he falls into a river and is captured. Specifically, he's manhandled by a Pequot by the name of Manipoide. And the English he was working with came from the Connecticut militia. Now, what follows and what happens to Kananchet is a gruesome uh, display of symbolism of the alliance that had been building against the Narragansett and the Wampanoag. First, the Pequot shot Kananchet dead. The Mohegans were then enabled to cut off his head. The Niantics were given Kananchet's body, which they quartered and burned, and the head was given to the Connecticut militia, where it was taken to Hartford to be put on display. Now, this in its own way shows you how important Kananchet was. This and the fact that the seed corn he was supposed to get, it does not appear it made its way back to the Connecticut River Valley and King Philip's camp. Some historians credit this moment with the definite turn towards the end of the war, wherein Philip and his allies realized they would need to sue for peace or a truce of some kind, as a harvest in the fall did not seem likely, especially with the Mohawk at their backs. But those unfamiliar with warfare uh, might not know that planning to sue for peace does not mean you're ending the hostilities or even backing off or taking a defensive position. In fact, often in war, when you know you're, you're losing and you know you're going to have to go to the negotiating table, you try to have the strongest hand possible when you're at that table. And so the attacks would continue. April 21st, 500 Nipmucks descend upon Sudbury, killing 30 English. Come to the table with a strong hand. Another card to throw down would be your captives. So having more captives mean you might get better terms of surrender. 
you have something to negotiate with. But the window to extract the maximum benefit from having these captives was closing and food dwindling. You have to feed these captives if you want them to stay alive to be of any use to you. And now, Philip and his allies barely have enough food to feed themselves. I'm going to turn to Mary Rowlinson now on the condition of some of these captives. Concerning one older woman, she having much grief upon her spirit and her miserable condition, being so near her time, she would often ask the Indians to let her go home, they not being willing to do that, and yet vexed by her importunity, gathered a great company together about her and stripped her naked, and set her in the midst of them, and when they had sung and danced about her in a hellish manner, as long as they pleased, they knocked her on the head, and the child in her arms with her. When they had done that, they made a fire and put them both into it, and told the other children that were with them that if they attempted to go home, they would serve them in a like manner. Desperate times for Philip and his allies. In fact, in the very next chapter, Mary relates how the English army was quickly closing in on their camp, and the stoutest men were sent out to hold off the English, while everyone else made a quick retreat, including Mary and the other captives in tow. After this, she inquired often about her son, whom she was separated from, but who was also taken captive. There was a native who claimed to have killed and eaten him. She was relieved to find out that was not true. But she also gathered pieces of information about the situation of Philip and his company in what she calls in her chapter the 13th remove. In other words, the 13th time that this Wampanoag camp was moved, Philip had sent a party to find the French and their native allies and be in receipt of guns, only to have that party be set upon by the Mohawk and four of his people killed. Mary took to begging between the different wigwams for scraps of food, which Weedemo took offense to, owning Mary and implying that she wasn't taking good care of Mary. Mary says of this event, Then I went to my mistress's wigwam, and they told me I disgraced my master with begging, and that if I did so any more, they would knock me in the head. I told them they had good as knock me in the head as starve me to death. Starvation can cause tempers to flare, even when you are the defenseless one. Not too long after this, Mary actually says of Widemo that she was a severe and proud dame she was, bestowing every day and dressing herself neat, as much time as any of the gentry of the land, powdering her hair and painting her face, going with necklaces and jewels in her ears and bracelets upon her hands. When she addressed herself, her work was to make girdles of wampum and beads. An interesting insight into Widemo's fashion, even in the bleakest of times, not too long after this, Mary uh, mentions the starvation that was breaking out generally. It wasn't just the captives. She mentions that everyone resorted to eating things that hogs and dogs would not eat in normal circumstances. By the 14th and 15th remove, King Philip and his allies were becoming quite desperate. Turning to the east on May 8th, 1676, the Wampanoag descended upon Bridgewater, Massachusetts, only to withdraw after a Pawa, a word for their shaman, named Tiskpaqui, and I know I'm saying that wrong, envisioned Cheapy as a bear. Cheapy being their god of the underworld, their god of death, destruction. Whereas earlier in the war, the Manitos of the natives of southern New England seemed to be winning against the Christian god. Through victories and signs and fortunes, it seemed as if the native spirits were now warning the warring side against the English that the time for war was turning over, and now it was a time for peace. The Plymouth Colony, making their full turn, began arming Christian Wampanoag this month and extend forgiveness to the fighting Wampanoag who willingly surrender. The promise of forgiveness will not always be granted. By the end of May, the Narragansett are suing for a peace. The Massachusetts Colony sends a native diplomat to them, in order to respond to this overture. But it was the Connecticut colony smelling victory. Now remember, the Narragansett lands are right near the Connecticut lands. There's opportunity there for them specifically. They capture the agent representing Massachusetts. And therefore, in this moment, there would be no peace. But a little bit of skullduggery there, even between the English colonies. And as far as the Nipmuc were concerned, end of May all the way through June of 1676, Captain William Turner's force ravaged the Nipmuc section of the Connecticut River, hemmed in by Massachusetts on one side and now the Mohawk on the other. Moving into the summer, the Nipmuc now sue for peace. And by June of 1676, central Massachusetts is now freed of native attacks. 
the conversation goes unrecorded, but it is clear that King Philip could no longer be in Nip Muck country, not if they were to expect a peace with Massachusetts. Whether he saw the writing on the wall or the Nip Muck informed him, he was now expected to leave Nip Muck territory. And where was he to go at this point? His former allies not welcoming him, being too much of a liability. Heading west would again only incur the wrath of the Mohawk. Perhaps he could go north to those more distant native groups that decided to attack the English alongside Philip. Not exactly strong allies, but using the opportunity. And yet it seems the Mohawk even had these groups scared to take in Philip. He had no alternative but to go home. Go back to the territory of his specific sachemship, the Poconokets, and the area around Mount Hope. Meanwhile, even some of his closest allies are surrendering to authorities in Plymouth, Massachusetts, and Connecticut. This is when Ben Church re-enters our story, where in his account, he reports at this point, the native groups that were outstanding against the English were surrendering in droves. From these natives, he learned that the Sackinets, formerly part of Philip's Wampanoag Confederacy or Paramount Chieftainship, had left Philip's camp. Now, if you remember, Ben Church had a friendly relationship with the Squaw Sachem of the Sackinets, Awashonks, and he manages to arrange a meeting with her where he actually apologizes to her for never returning back to her before the outbreak of the war, as he promised, in order to secure protection for her and her people against Philip, which of course caused her to throw her lot in with Philip. She then agrees to now fight against Philip with the Englishman at Plymouth. Now, this was a great betrayal to Philip. The historian William Hubbard, and I'm not sure where he gets this from, but it paints a good picture, right? The historian William Hubbard recorded that the Sackinet betrayal broke Philip's heart. Not a good June for Philip. And now he has to return to his homeland, having only his own Poconokit warriors. He had a few Narragansett and then a scattering of others who were still loyal to him. And perhaps in a bit of a swan song, he hits the town of Swansea again on June 16th and June 26th. And then turning to the poor Narragansett, who tried to make a peace with the Massachusetts colony, Connecticut now seizes the opportunity to just crush them. The Mohegan and the Pequot, along with a force of Englishmen under Major Talcott from Connecticut, spend July of 1676 indiscriminately killing in Narragansett country. The three-part army attacks the native settlement at Nipsachunk. They kill 126 or 127 men, women, and children in this one attack, and they take 45 women and children captive. The very next day, they come upon a group of Narragansett who are seeking to surrender at Warwick, Rhode Island. And over that 48-hour period, the Mohegans, the Pequot, and Talcott from Connecticut end up taking or killing in total 238 or so people by my count. I could be off. All the while, Talcott did not lose a single man. Meanwhile, towards the end of July 1676, the Sackinets now turn towards the English side. They find the Narragansett Sachem Quinnipin leading his people back home. And whereas six weeks before they were allies, the Sackinets now fall upon them, killing many and scattering the people, who would include his wife, Widemo, having gave up Mary Rowlinson back in May and now running for her life, hoping she wouldn't become a captive. And yet, like Philip, there were a few places left to run. Where were they to go? If they went back to Nipa country, that would do them no good. Starting just a few days before the Sackinets attacked, many of the Nipmuc began actually walking to Boston to surrender. Ben Church is with the Sackinets, and now the Sackinets are on the side of the English, and use their ambiguous status to lure out enemy natives, not hip to the news. But instead of a wholesale slaughter, they offered forgiveness, and the English actually managed to get natives along the way to join the Sackinet force. And so the longer the Sackinets and Church were out there, the more power they had. Not a good sign for the Narragansett that they're after. On April 6th, Church and the Sackinets come upon the party of Quinnipin and Wiedemo. Quinnipin is taken, and Wiedemo's body is found in a river. And that was the end of Wiedemo, daughter of Corbitant and widow of King Alexander, Philip's older brother. Quinnipin's head is cut off and put on display on a pike. The Narragansett are now completely reduced. The Nipmuc have surrendered, and even those within the Wampanoag Paramount Chieftainship 
have mostly turned over to the English in one fashion or another. In fact, there really is no war left to be had in southern New England. There were native nations in northern New England who would continue to attack the English for years to come, and did so without really any affiliation to Philip. Philip's followers were reduced to a core of faithful Poconokets, essentially now an entourage around the man himself. Having returned to their own supposed territory, Philip found the area swarming with unfriendly natives, all searching for him after a year of fighting and running. His people were exhausted, many near death. There were reports that living among the swamps and hiding out throughout July and August of 1676, parents were killing their young children in order to maintain absolute silence. Tadasson, one of Philip's leading warriors and a sachem himself, died of a broken heart after his young son succumbed to a disease in the swamps. The Sackinets and Ben Church, they turned back east now to hunt down Philip himself. They found that they were easily able to overcome many of the remaining Poconokets. Church records taking 170 captive. Among them were Philip's wife, another daughter of Corbitant and a sister of Wiedemo, along with King Philip's own son. Indeed, at this point, Church and the Sackinets, along with their other allies, had pushed Philip to the very edge. He had been running for months now, all the while hemorrhaging warriors and allies, and now his innermost family. Church asked one captive as to the condition of Philip, and the native said, You have now made Philip ready to die. But indeed, it's hard to track down that one specific person. It's easy to find groups. Now that Philip uh, was at his lowest of lows, he remained elusive. But for many of the English, it, it didn't really matter at this point. Philip was essentially neutered. He had no power, and he no longer appeared to be a threat. Many of the English fighters especially from Massachusetts and Connecticut, were already headed home. Philip became restricted to Mount Hope, and specifically he went to a high place, now known as King Philip's Seat, among other names, with just a handful of his closest men. One of them advised Philip, quite frankly, that the war was over and lost, and it was time to surrender. Philip, in a rage, kills the man in front of his own brother, another advisor to King Philip, known to us uh, in history as John Alderman. Alderman concludes then and there to seek revenge upon Philip. And it is John Alderman who slips away and goes to the English. He finds Ben Church and he tells him, I know exactly where Philip is. Let's go get him. And one of the elder sachems who advised Philip and who was still with him reported later on that faithful day that Philip the night before did dream that his demise was near. And that day was August 12th, early in the morning, Captain Church, Captain Golden, and their men, along with John Alderman, surprised King Philip's camp. Philip's few remaining supporters, true to their allegiance, tried to engage the English and their native allies to give coverage to Philip's retreat. But it was the sharpshooting of John Alderman himself whose gun finally took down King Philip. And with that, he was gone. On August 17th, 1676, almost 55 years after Thanksgiving, Yes, the mythical Thanksgiving between his father and the Plymouth settlers, Plymouth celebrated another Thanksgiving, and it was for the death of Philip, and his head was in attendance. The rest of his body was quartered, and the hands of Philip were given to John Alderman, who was said to have sold one and kept another in a container of alcohol, charging people small fee to look at it. It is known that a sacanet quartered Philip's body, and there are various accounts what happened to the other parts of King Philip's body, not terribly important right now. Because what of the poor man's family? What's going on with them? Many wanted to execute Philip's young son, who was still just a, a young boy. It was finally decided that the boy and Philip's wife would be spared death and instead sold away as slaves to a faraway island. And soon after Philip's death, Church and company tracked down the last of Philip's inner circle which included an old advisor named Anawan, who was likely an advisor to King Philip's father, Massasoit, or Osemequin, and his brother, King Alexander, and quite possibly was present during the first fabled Thanksgiving. Anawan had been taken by surprise and offered no fight. Now that very night, Captain Church and his men camped alongside Anawan and his party. Church writes that deep into the night, while everyone else slept, Church and Anawan spoke around the campfire. Benjamin Church, of course, having many questions. 
Anawan told him that King Philip dreamt that the English would find him that very day. Church asks him about the causes of the war. Anawan specified that the praying Indians were to blame and the young braves desperate for valor on the side of Philip. Anawan says that King Philip finally, not being able to resist the pressure internally and externally, was pushed into a war with the English. This counters what many historians who write about King Philip's war claim that Philip spent years plotting meticulously to mastermind an attack against the English. Doesn't seem to be that way here. Now, before we break down Philip as a leader, let's look at some of the short-term effects of this war. Per capita, this is one of the deadliest colonial wars of the English or anyone. Uh, the New Englanders lost over 2,000, perhaps as many as 2,800 people for what I've seen estimates for. This would be a time when New England roughly had 50,000 people in population, and over half of their settlements were attacked and some abandoned completely. The story for the natives, of course, would be far worse. We're talking about anywhere from 2,000 to 6,000 natives dead out of a population of what, of what might have been about 20,000 in southern New England, which would have meant the death of anywhere from 15 to 30 percent of the native population, not counting those who were sold away into slavery. Among the native Wampanoag, of course, on the islands of Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket, life went on without much change, at least in the near future. Of all those praying towns that John Eliot had founded, they were gone. John Eliot was about 72 years old and a week 72 at that. He would rebuild his earliest town, Nantic, and after that he just disappears from the record. It's likely he died not too long after that. A little to the west concerning the Nipmuc, the records are scarce, but it seems as if the Nipmuc fell upon themselves between those who sought a pardon from the government of Massachusetts and those who did not. Perhaps we could characterize this period afterwards as a short civil war among the Nipmuc. Now, with the short-term effects out of the way, let's assess the man himself, King Philip. There are those historians who greatly lionize Philip, starting, believe it or not, with the Puritan writers uh, after the war themselves, because he was the man who the Puritans bested, and they could aggrandize their own view of themselves by making their vanquished foe a great, great man. But if we really look at King Philip, it's very clear there was no pan-native alliance, despite literature that says otherwise. Philip was not a great leader, neither a skilled campaigner on the field of battle, nor capable of uniting distant native nations on an effective scale, against the English anyway. As I said earlier, it seems as if the English were more scared of the ghost of Philip than the man himself. Every attack during this war, it was an attack by Philip's natives, whether or not he was there or planned it. So who are our real heroes of King Philip's war on the side of the natives who are fighting the English? Well, in terms of actual fighting, it has to be Kananchet. If you put Philip up against Kananchet in terms of attacks that they led, the people that they killed, just Kananchet's drive into the Plymouth colony and through Rhode Island alone make him far superior to Philip. When Kananchet heard that he was to be executed, he said, I like it well, I shall die before my heart is soft. Come on, that, he's our number one draft pick, right? Now, which native nation makes our VIP for Philip's side? I would have to go with the Nipmuc for their devastating attacks on central Massachusetts, their harboring of Philip's people and other allied peoples, and then their ability to bring native nations to their west into the conflict. And now, who do we have for honorable mentions? Well, I can think of two individuals, shouldn't surprise you, Awashanks, for being weary of the war in the first place, but then, in, then going along when she had no other choice and she wanted to stay with her people. But then also remaining faithful to that side up until the very end when she was able to switch sides and then bring her people along with her. So, honorable mention there. She found an opportunity where none seemed to be present changed the fate of herself and her people by switching sides, and effectively, they were able to prove their worth. And on that note, our last honorable mention for this side would have to be John Alderman, who stayed loyal to Philip until King Philip himself killed Alderman's brother. Yes, he fought all the fights, and he starved, and he ran with Philip, slept in the swamps, and plotted against the English. Seems, he seems to me to be a man of honor for, for his side. But that honor 
would lead him to ultimately side against Philip because Philip killed the man's brother. And in the native societies along the Atlantic coast of North America, that was justification for vengeance. And John Alderman sure got that vengeance. An interesting thing here to note is that King Philip's war began with a Wampanoag killing another Wampanoag. And it ended with Wampanoag killing Wampanoag. Over the course of this season, going all the way back to the time before Plymouth in 1620, early on in the interactions between the Wampanoag and the English, it was actually the Island Wampanoag and the Cape Wampanoag that were the most hostile. The Cape Wampanoag were intolerant of the Plymouth settlers before they even actually settled at Plymouth. As they had robbed the graves on their way to find their final place of settlement, and the natives of uh, Martha's Vineyard, such as Epinal, who is sometimes described as a Nosset, who nonetheless these groups would fall under the paramount chieftainship in the next decade. After a series of kidnappings, the people on the island would meet the English with a hail of arrows on the beach. It was really these two groups of Wampanoag and their near relatives who had the correct response to the English, the long-term response to the English, which was be violent when they're weak, small in number, and just showing up on the shore. In the short term, this sounds like a terrible plan. It doesn't lead to trade or the acquisition of any new allies. Whereas Massasoit, whose name was Osemequin, approved of the Plymouth settlement and looked to them as allies in a moment when they were particularly weak and thus allowed the English to take root. Now, over the course of Massasoit's life, it was to his personal advantage to keep this friendship going. But on a scale larger than a lifetime, just even into the lifetime of his own children, it was a disaster. And then when his dynasty decided to finally turn against the English, it was too late. Looking at the long view again, the Massasoit dynasty's approach to their interactions with the English, wherein you're gracious when they're weak and you're violent when they're very strong, was less than optimal. We'll just put it that way. Now let's compare the reaction again to the Cape Wampanoag and the Island Wampanoag, who were violent when the English were weak and yet, as the English grew in power, these were the first groups to convert to Christianity, pull away from the native paramount chief, and seek to be allies, and yes, even subjects of the English at times. Now here we're at the end of King Philip's War, and which communities are left intact? Or which communities are most easily rebuilt? Those who stood out against the English, the picture is bleak. The very word Poconoket became a mark of death, and those of whom the term applied now used the more general term Wampanoag to avoid persecution. That being the few Poconogets who were not sold into slavery or died during the war. Now there were some who sought refuge among the neutral or English allied groups, especially the young children, and managed to assimilate into those. Those who were enslaved were sent to faraway places, as I mentioned before, and they lost their ethnic identity if they were able to have offspring at all. Those who weren't sold into faraway places, some of them and, and their descendants were enslaved locally clear into the 18th century with no sense of community, losing sense of their heritage, living as an underclass. But again, it was those Island and Cape Wampanoag that endured, fighting them early, fight them when they're weak. And then as the English filled in this new transatlantic world, these communities decided to also find a place within it. Now, this is quite remarkable. The remarkable ability to survive as a community, which in this case cannot be overstated. Now there's a Native American saying that goes something like, the pilgrims landed on Plymouth Rock, but Plymouth Rock landed on us. The very first group that this would apply to would be the Wampanoag. And the wheel of history turning as it has, they should have ceased existing a long time ago. There are many Native American nations that don't exist, haven't existed for hundreds of years. And yet the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe endures to this day on Cape Cod, federally recognized along with the Wampanoag tribe of Gayhead, which exists on Martha's Vineyard. And let's not act like after King Philip's war, it was all just smooth sailing from there. They had centuries of oppression ahead of them, developers trying to eke away acre by acre chunks of their land, and waves of plague, which did not cease. And yet there they are. They're still here to this day. In the first episode of our Wampanoag series, when I was speaking of their pre-European traditions, the best as it could be reconstructed, a lot of the sources I used came from members of these two communities, the ones that exist today, despite their early conversion to Christianity. They became paradoxically the most prominent preservers of their ancient culture. Not the only ones, but certainly the most well-published. 
Uh, now, I will note there are other Wampanoag communities, and more specifically, Poconokit groups, who are seeking recognition, and good luck to them. But in terms of just the number of established communities, those who distance themselves from the Wampanoag Paramount Chieftainship early set up enduring communities with less hardships than their kin who went on into King Philip's War on Philip's side. I think of groups like the Beothuk in what's now Newfoundland or the Timuquoans who lived in what is now Georgia or northern Florida, the later group having many times the population of the Wampanoag at its height. Again, under similar circumstances as the Wampanoag, they simply don't exist anymore, and they haven't existed for a long time. Now, I know I'm being redundant, but the more I read and research and talk about the Wampanoag, the more remarkable they become. But with that, perhaps I'm stalling, because this is the end of our Wampanoag episodes. I have to say goodbye, and I've said enough. So if you like this podcast, give it a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Remember, you can always send me a brick of gold if you wish. I wouldn't mind that. This has been the Other States of America History Podcast. I'm Eric Giannis. Thank you for listening.